Yeah, so good morning once again, and welcome to uh, our lectures for the week. Um, we had left off with, uh, 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 with with couple of questions, which I did mention that I would come back to, and I just thought it was important that we uh, just uh, bring back those questions and just address that. So one of the questions that I had written down was, um, I think it came from, uh, you know, uh, the bans in marriage, why are the bans read? So um, it is, it's just like, like we had mentioned, like I did mention the last time, it's a proclamation, it's a public announcement of the, uh, of two people being married. It originated from, I think the early Catholic church, which has been followed by all churches um, so that uh, the announcement is made to uh, the the public of two people joining in together in marriage it also a requirement um, in case there there occurs any kind of legal aspect so that's with the bands of marriage the second question um, that came about was uh, in the old testament do we have accounts of unmarried <clears throat> men so so like i again as we have discussed there a lot of those records aren't given um, but, um, uh, but, you know, we probably can safely maybe assume that uh, uh, there were some of these prophets like Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Ezra, Elisha, Elijah, um, all of them were probably unmarried uh, because of the kind of, uh, you know, ministry they had, uh, what, what they led. So it, it's not, it's not given uh, in detail, but um, uh, we we know from what the records have said. So definitely in Jeremiah, there is, um, you know, scripture says uh, God tells him not to take a wife from the place that he's uh, he has been there at that point of time. But we don't know if if it was there later. But through the accounts that we have, it has not been uh, that significant record has not been given. So these were two questions I just wanted to bring back um, from what we had uh, discussed the last time. Okay, right. So we are going to uh, go ahead with um, what we had left off with the last time and uh, to uh, maybe a quick brief. Would somebody just like to unmute and uh, quickly discuss what we had covered the last uh, two, uh, two, two lectures in the last week? So anybody would like to brave it out? Yes, anyone? Someone whose voice we haven't heard up till now, anybody's. Uh, I hope I'm on and you can all hear me because there's deadly silence. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, okay. Yeah, so anybody would like to... Uh, okay, ma'am, I'll try. <laughs> yes, yes, Avni, go ahead, go ahead. So we learned about uh, the attitudes, temperament, and behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing is, uh, in every relationship, um, is determined by certain characteristics. So... Uh, when we say attitude, uh, attitude is the way of uh, feeling about things or thinking about something in a particular way. So uh, it matters as to what is our attitude towards things, maybe like marriage or you gave an example of junk food or other things. So that is one. And then temperament, it's uh, our nature. Uh, how and what is our inclination towards doing some things? Uh, maybe we may be extrovert or introvert or uh, we may have, uh, you know, that kind of uh, attitude where we, we have defined ourselves and we often, you know, talk about it and say, oh, I'm a shy person or I'm an extrovert person. So that is our temperament. Then comes behavior where... Uh, it's about the action and things uh, we do. So how we behave in certain situations, uh, in pressures, in 
times uh, how how we react to things or maybe we respond to things probably uh, this is what and then uh, ma'am you thought about uh, when we are married uh, in different situations uh, we are we should be uh, our attitude should and temperament should be guided by uh, christ likeness uh, the way lord um, has taught us to uh, handle certain situations so everything um, basically should be uh, guided by the word the scriptures the way lord taught us and uh, this is how we can you know renew our minds and um, then uh, that's as much as we covered abni okay thanks <laughs> wonderful thank you so much thank you 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 really consolidated that really well thank you okay great okay so we had talked about uh, in detail we had spoken about attitudes and temperament um we had highlighted the fact that um it's important for us to recognize and identify what could be our negative attitudes or our dysfunctional temperament and uh, understand that we make a choice to to change from having negative attitudes to having attitudes that are more christ like and having a temperament that we feel um is not uh, you know is is maybe dysfunctional could be dysfunctional uh, but being led by the holy spirit being controlled by the holy spirit in all that we um we are the the nature or the inclination that is there within us Uh, so today we're going to look a little bit more in detail about um, uh, our behaviors and then get into understanding how is it that we can make this transition from a negative space to what really god designed us or wanted us to be so when we look at our behavior um you know if if you if you just have uh cross sectional understanding of why you behave a certain way you may probably like for example let's take an example maybe you're having um uh, you know an argument with somebody and uh, at that point of time you know when the argument gets heated up you probably raise your voice you probably say a couple of things that may be uh, unkind or you may walk out of the room so th all of this suggests uh you know what you're doing is is a behavior but suggests something more deeper and there is something within the heart that actually leads you into a form of behavior or an action so uh, when we look at the way we behave one of the important things we need to um hold on to that the standard of our behavior as a believer there is a standard of our behavior which should be in alignment with the word so how we behave and i think you know in 24/7 uh if you're awake you will you will you can actually reflect to look at how is it that you behave is this in standard with what god has spoken about in his word or does this come out of a fleshly uh desire or a fleshly uh motive right so when maybe when you're having an argument with with it uh, what do i mean by being um having a standard of the word is that maybe i use uh, you know it's important to use kind words it's important not to um repay evil with evil uh to be patient to be gentle to be kind to be loving as against maybe a more uh a fleshly behavior would probably be what what i had explained earlier you know maybe you bang the door and get out or huff and puff and um maybe get angry and speak up in a loud voice or use sarcasm or use uh some forms of uh, uh unkind words so all of this shows us what our behavior is and we know we understand that our standard for our behavior should come from the word of god so why would this be what would our motive be it is the love for god that is shown through in our behavior our love for god should demonstrate what our behavior should pan out to be so when you look at scripture you know in uh, 2 timothy 3:6 to 17 it says all scripture is inspired by god and is useful for what for teaching us the truth 
for correction, for rebuking, uh, and for giving instruction for right living. So if you look at this, the word of God is truth that helps us rebuke all forms of faults or errors. It corrects our faults. It gives us instruction on the way that we need to live. So we fall back on to the, on to the word of God to guide how we behave and how we conduct ourselves. So if you look at scripture, there are, I mean, it is replete with, with, um, with many, many verses that shows us as to how our behavior needs to be. But we would probably you know, take a couple of verses and just quickly look at what are some of those behavioral, what does the word teach us, especially in, in our relationship with others and in, especially in our relationship with marriage. So let's, uh, I'm at uh, page um, um, 61. Yeah, I'm at page 61 and you could follow through um, as I read and we will just pick up some of those um, uh, those those forms of behavior that God desires for us as his chosen people uh, that, that we must be clothed with. Okay, so Colossians 3, 12 to 15, could I request somebody to read the scripture? Um, anyone, any of you can just read the scripture. Colossians 3, 12 to 15. Can I read that? Yes, yes, sir. yes. Charles or Prabhaka, any of you, any of you can read. Yeah, I'll go with it. Um, yes. You are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all these qualities add love which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives us to is to guide us, uh, guide you in the decisions you make for it is uh, to this peace that God has called you together in, in the one body and be thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhaka. Um, uh, Charles, you could read First Peter 3, 7 to 11 in, a, in two minutes. Uh, so I just want to highlight some of the, um, the you know, the, the way that we can conduct ourselves as we relate with people. So if you look at Colossians 3, verse 12, it talks about how you clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So these are all virtues of behavior. Then that shows tolerance. It shows um, forgiveness, adding to these qualities love, which is in verse 14, uh, so that the peace of Christ uh, guides you in the decisions you make. So when you clothe yourself with these, um, I call them as like uh, call them as virtues of behavior, something that the power of the Holy Spirit um, needs to you know, when, when you yield yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit, these are things that come up even in dif difficult situations that may cause us to be quite opposite to what, what is being said here, right? But that's what God's called us to do, that uh, there is a standard of how we need to behave and we need to be in, all right? Okay, let's move to First Peter 3, 7 to 11. This has a, a little more probably, you know, adds on to um, the instruction given to both the husbands and the wives. Uh, yes, Charles, please go ahead. First Peter 3, 7 through 11. In the same way, you husbands must live with your wives with the proper understanding that they are more delicate than you. Treat them with respect because they also will receive together with you God's gift of life. Do this so that nothing will interfere with your prayers. To conclude, you must all have the same attitude and the same feelings, love one another, and be kind and humble with one another. Do not pay back evil with evil or cursing with cursing. Instead, pay back with a blessing, because a blessing is what God promised to give you when he called you. As the scripture says, 
if you want to enjoy life and wish to see good times, you must keep from speaking evil and stop telling lies. You must turn away from evil and do good. You must strive for peace with all your heart. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Charles. So when you look at this, I mean, there are specific instructions on how we relate to one another, right? So uh, going back to verse 7, it talks about living with the proper understanding with, with your wives uh, and also the other way, treating with respect. Okay, so how, do, how does that come about in our actions and in our behavior? Um, no. Any examples? How would you treat your spouse with respect? Any example? Come on. Compliment her. Compliment her. Okay. All right. What else? What else would be treating with respect? And I could <laughs> appreciate everything that she does. Okay, appreciation. Like small and big things, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you also do respect, uh, Anita, yes? Brother Tarun, tell us. Uh, yes, Anita, go ahead, go ahead. Ask them for their opinion and take their okay. opinion. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, taking the opinions of your spouse and valuing what they have said rather than shooting it down. Excellent, wonderful. Anything else? Anybody else? You can put it up on the chat if you need to. Yes, Samuel, go on. Taking their permission. <laughs> Taking <Opinion>. their permission. <laughs> Taking their opinions. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think there are... Yeah, go on. No, no, sorry. The most times, I mean, uh, I think it's like when Anita was saying, taking their opinion, I find on the contrary, like most husbands taking permission from their wives to <laughs> do certain okay. things. So. Thanks. Okay. All right. Okay. Not taking them for granted. Okay. So, so it, it, I mean, you can find very many, even probably, you know, giving them, treating them with respect is the way that you talk to them also, right? Maybe um, in front of the children, how do you talk to them? Uh, is it out of kindness or is it out of, um, you know, a, a sense of anger? So how do you talk to them? Yeah, so treating them with respect. Then we go on to um, loving one another, being kind, humble, not paying back evil with evil or cursing with cursing, paying back with a blessing. Okay, and if you look at the last verse, um, you must turn away evil and do good. Strive for peace. So striving for peace is ensuring that let's say there's an argument there is something that or a, a, you know a, a, a heated chat about something striving for peace and it can be in your behavior where you can actually uh, you know uh, uh, want to keep the conversation as respectful so striving for peace through these situations yes uh, anita i think you had a question no ma'am will that agree to disagree would go with that strive for peace <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, it does. It does too. Okay. So, so as, as we see, um, we need these, all our behaviors, especially in the ways that we deal with, with uh, significant people in our lives needs to be governed by, by God's word. So, uh, so when we look at these three things we spoke about, these aspects of our attitude, our temperament, and our behavior, um, we understand we understand that these these are things that we need to align to to what God has what God has instructed for us in our in our in our lives. However, when we actually look in reality, our the attitudes or the temperament or the behavior that we, um, you know, have or that that we possess may be far from what really God desires of us. So, so how do we come to that place um, of uh, of of moving from what we are right now, okay, to what we are called to be? So, all of us in this call and everyone around. You know, we are all, as scripture says, we have all sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.24. So we are all in that place of being sinful in the way that we think, 
maybe about others, about things, in the way that we respond, some of our inclinations, and even our behaviors. When we look back, we, we may be carrying so many things that are not as how God wanted us to wanted us or you know want us to be so to be able to recognize that first yes i may be emotionally hurt maybe someone has hurt me over and over again and i carry that hurt i carry that negative thought i mistrust um, maybe my my spouse or i or i uh, uh, find myself unable to be open um, to to them because of the hurt that i carry within Okay, sometimes our thinking gets very, uh, very um, uh, uh, distorted because of what we think about the person, because of certain things that they've done. We don't see them in the way that God sees them, that they may, you know, that they are created in the image of God and they are God's gift to us. We may not see them, see them like that. And even, even in our behavior, we may be bound to, to things, to ways and patterns and lifestyles that may be wrong um, and, and often feel that, you know, that is a part of us, that is who we are, that is something that we can, um, you know, we can't change about ourselves. But what scripture shows us is that, you know, scripture shows us of us being a new man, of being transformed by God, not just in you know, in one area of our spirits, but also in, in the things of our mind and the things of our body to be able to align ourselves uh, in accordance to what the scripture says. So for our transformation, there are four truths. And, and I think this is, this is a very personal, um, you know, uh, this is something any one of us can do, not just for those who are married, but any one of us can can begin to um, establish to see how we can have our inner man transformed. So we want just want to present four basic truths, okay? Something that we all know, we 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 we've all heard of many times, but yet something that's foundational to the change in our inner man. So the first two things that we are going to be looking at is something that has already been done for us. It's, it's a work that has already been completed. But then the other two that we are looking in is something that is ongoing, something that we need to keep walking in, something that is progressive for us, that we need to be aware of doing um, regularly. So let's just dive into these, to these, uh, the, uh, what these truths are. So the first one is um, what what Jesus did on the cross and the power that that the cross bought for us. Okay, what Jesus' work did on the cross for us. So that's the first one. The second one is who we are in Christ. What is our identity um, in Christ? So these are things that has already been done for us. There's not, no striving for us. There's nothing that we need to do. It's already finished. It's already done. We just have to receive it we just have to take it on we just have to believe it and and begin uh, a lot walking in the power of those truths okay so let's look at um uh, at these two the first two of the power of the cross so what jesus did on the cross not only bought you and me forgiveness but it also gave us the freedom from the power of our sin okay not just forgiveness and, and our sins, but also he gave us uh, dominion over sin. Okay, the free, freedom from, the, from, from that sin, whatever sin grasped us into, whatever it holds us uh, into, that's the freedom that, that we have. And as a result of which there comes a wholeness, a healing of our bodies, our spirits and our minds. So what did sin do to us? It broke us. It completely separated us from uh, what we had with God as well as broke us uh, in, in all of what God created us to be. But because of the cross, we have been made whole. We have been made righteous. We have been justified. We are as new creation. And that's what we need to hold on to, to receive for ourselves. So if just looking at scripture, I'm just going to pick up one of those scriptures of Romans 6, 6 to 14, and I'll read that for you. And we know that our old being has been put to death with Christ on his cross in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed so that we should no longer be the slaves of sin. Sin must not be your master for you do not live under 
under law, but under God's grace. So because of what Christ did for us, not only do we have complete forgiveness and complete wholeness through his death on the cross, we're also dead to sin. Okay, we're also dead to sin. Um, and uh, so what does this mean? This also includes all of what we've been talking about, those negative attitudes, the, the uh, unhealthy temperaments or those lifestyles that we are in or any kind of behavioral patterns that are sinful in nature. The power of that has been lost, um, lost in us. So this means that none of this, these habits or these patterns or these attitudes has a power, has a control over us. It does not have a hold over us bec because we are free from the clutches of that sin. We are free because of the power of Christ. And everything that Jesus did is for us and, and he provided it for us. So not just, it, it's just not uh, wholeness. It's, um, it's the power of sin. The, the power of sin has been lost and as a result of that, we are also able to extend that forgiveness to someone who has who has hurt us or who has um, wronged us in any way. So through the power of the cross, and we stand in, um, uh, you know, knowing this truth over and over again, just declaring that this truth that he he has. Uh, uh, he has done for us um, becomes the very basis for our for our uh, living, and the more that we keep ourselves focused on that finished work of Christ, you know, and claiming it, what uh, claiming whatever He has provided for us and walking in that, you know, we we can live not just in peace with what what we are going through but also in peace with our brother or peace with our spouse so the first thing like i said is the power of the cross the second one is our identity in christ so um and and i'm sure i think um, uh, the first years did have this probably as a topic of of your um of who we are in christ right and um so to it comes from greatly from understanding what what did Christ bring for us through his death? So once you and I have accepted the Lord, are born again, there is a relationship that we have with Christ. We are in him. Okay, so we are in him, in, in spirit. So, uh, you know, so, uh, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, you become a new creation in Christ. So as a new creation, everything changes about us. Nothing of, our, of what we have been, that's the old one, that, that old man, that gets, that, that, that is moved out, that is, that is finished. And we have, we are in a new creation. So the old is gone, the new has come. Okay, And our identity and everything that we are standing on uh, is because of who we are in Christ. So we are we are uh, empowered and we are blessed because we are in Christ. Okay. So once we are born again, we need to live in this new identity. We cannot assume uh, an earlier identity. Okay. It's like uh, I I'd, I'd give you an example of uh, let's say if you are um, Mm, you know, let's let's think about a child who's who's born in a um, in in an in a you know a very poor background or a poor economic background, and there is someone who comes and adopts him into his family, where where he has everything um, that that he needs. He's got his excess food and his room and his clothes and opportunities, everything that's there. Now, if this little boy decides every time, you know, to go back to his old life, you know, he is going to be getting what he got there. But he has been bought, you know, without any uh, anything, without any cost to this new life. So, so it is important for the child, for the boy, to live in this new identity, to begin to see everything that, uh, you know, his adopted father has given him. So similarly, we need to live out of this new life, this identity and whatever Christ has done for us. And when we begin to do so, we begin to change the way we uh, just not 
see ourselves, we also change the way we look at people around us. Okay, uh, our our understanding or our attitude towards everything changes because of our identity in Christ. Our perspective about things of of um, you know even even of, of forces of evil changes because we know who we are in Christ. So these two truths, if we really understand and live uh, out of these these truths, that is the completed work of Christ on the cross, as well as our identity in Christ, our lives are very different. You know, we live extremely positive and confident life. So I, I think I'd, I'd just, um, yeah, maybe just give you an example. So, um, and this is a personal example. Mm. So years before, uh, th there, there were times that, um, you know, there was a lot of, which, which I'm sure a lot of us will be able to, um, um, uh, you know, uh, identify with what I'm saying. So because of some circumstances that have happened, there was a lot of self-condemnation that, you know, I grew up with, you know, just often thinking and telling myself that I wasn't good enough, I couldn't do certain things, um, you know, uh, there was always somebody better than me, you know, those usual adolescent thoughts, I'm sure all of us have gone through that in some way or the other, right? But when it actually hit me when, and, and I'd read this verse a million times, but one day this verse actually popped out from scripture, you know, in bold, in color, in, uh, in all its bigness. And that is Romans 8, 1, which says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, now I, I, I was a believer since long and uh, never saw the truth about that, that in Christ, there was no more need for me to condemn myself. There was no more need to do that because he had taken my condemnation on the cross for me. Everything, every self-loathing, every self-hating, everything that uh, under conference, all of that was taken away. So the more that... I began to see the truth, the more I began to see that what I was doing was, was, um, was a choice that I was making. So it was like this poor child who decided to go back into, into the scum and the dirt and say, I don't have anything, where just across the road, I just need to you know, hop, skip and jump and I have everything. So it was my choice to decide whether to live in that truth or to live out of that lie. Okay, so the more that we begin to see what our identities, and this I'm, I'm, this is a very practical way of how we we find ourselves. So often they can be condemning ourselves because of some sin, right? You know, I I'll never change. This is something. Uh, the sin continues to hold over me, and that in itself, you know, we 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 diminish the work. <clears throat> of Christ on the cross and, and bring it to nothing when we do that, right? So to, so to, to live out of this completed work is what is, are these two important truths, the, um, the, the power of the cross as well as um, uh, our identity of who we are in Christ. So this is the first two things which is already done for you. Nothing you need to do. You've just got to believe it. You've just got to receive it. You have to begin to, um, you know, live in, in understanding the truth. Now, how do we do that? The, the next two things is something that we are called to do. It's, it's something that is ongoing. It's something that we need to ensure that we walk in a daily basis. What, the first one is renewing of our minds and walking in the spirit. Now, Romans 12, 2, um, very familiar verse. It says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So what is the renewing of, of, of our minds mean? It is changing the way we think. Renewing is to make new, is to change. So whatever thoughts or whatever ideas that we have been, that has become like a pattern for us, we change it by renewing our thinking, you know, changing the way that we think, thinking differently. And how? Not just thinking positively and, you know, good, but thinking according to God's word. 
our minds are renewed when we meditate on God's word. For our minds to be renewed, we cannot be doing positive psychology. We need to consistently and intentionally meditate on God's word and keep our thinking in alignment with, with the truth of God's word. So as, like I said, the example that I gave you, you know, being very self-critical, I had to... <clears throat> I had to repeat this verse over and over and over again till, you know, that verse found uh, my, my, my mind absorbed it and was full of it. And, and it grew into my veins and into my system and into my thinking. It had to change that way. So for us to change our thinking, we need to continue in, um, you know, like the cow does you know what the cow does it regurgitates his food its food that it you know it swallows it but then brings it back and and chomp 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 it chomp it churns it churns it churns it so much so that you know it's almost left to nothing but then again it comes back so that's the meditation we're looking at continuously um, uh, renewing our minds on specific areas so what so so how what do we do is identify now that's that's why we said of you know being able to recognize and acknowledge what is something that is wrong what attitude of mine is wrong or what is it that is promoting or bringing about the these negative intentions what is it and then coming back to to uh, re to renewing and perceiving things from the perspective of god's word and this is something that never changes never stops this is something that keeps going on and on because it's only when your mind is renewed you will begin to see changes in your attitudes in your behavior in your temperament so renewing of the mind is a very important uh, um, uh, truth of it. The fourth one is, yes, walking in the spirit. Now, in addition to just renewing our, our mind and meditating on God's word, we are also called to walk in the spirit. So what does this mean? You know, it is, if you look at Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, it says, um, do not get drunk with wine. Um, instead, be filled with the spirit. Okay, there are other verses that talks of how we give over our influence over, uh, you know, every form of our influence to the work of the Holy Spirit, where it says, you know, do not quench the working of the Holy Spirit in First Thessalonians 5.19 says, so that, you know, he continues to influence you and, and don't quench that working in you. So the more that you yield, when we fought, when we when we submit and we yield to the working of the of the Holy Spirit, being influenced um, and learning to follow that guidance of the Holy Spirit, we begin to also have have a change. We begin to um, uh, keep away whatever has been fleshly, okay, things that we may do out of uh, out of an impulse or out of our anger, which could be you know maybe um, saying unkind things, maybe getting angry, maybe it's probably quarrelling or it is envious, being envious, being sarcastic, or anything anything which all is being classified as the work of the flesh, right? But when the Holy Spirit uh, uh, enables us to, to put off, to put off our old self, to put off these sinful deeds. Like it says in Galatians 5, uh, 16, it says, walk in the spirit so that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the more, so there cannot be two natures in you. There has to be the spirit nature or it has to be the fle being, being fleshly controlled. And scripture says, those of us who are spirit controlled, we are, uh, you know, we are led to life. Those who are fleshly controlled, we are led to death, right? So when we walk in the spirit, we, we end everything that may be fleshly. Okay, and then we have the fruit of the spirit, as Galatians um, uh, 5, 24, uh, 24 to 25 talks about that. You know, when we live in the spirit, we also walk in the spirit and the fruit of the spirit gets manifested. Galatians 5, 22, 23, that, that, that goes in. So to, to, bring, to, to um, bring this entire thing uh, into a, a, a place of transformation, you know, a place where we're thinking right, where we're perceiving according to God's uh, God. We are communicating with, with these attitudes when we have a personality or an inclination or a nature that is yielded to the Holy Spirit, when we are governed by God's word, uh, 
doing these four on, on a continuous basis, walking in the spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to, uh, you know, to, to be with us. So even when you're engaging with someone, um, you know, I think it's a good practice to say, Holy Spirit, I yield, I, I give you my words, I give you my actions, I give you my feelings, I give it all to you so that it may be something that gives you glory and edifies somebody else. So just that prayer as you're doing it, you know, if, even if, if it's something that you're finding really difficult, yield, yield to the, to the power of the Holy Spirit. So these four important truths, the first two being completed, which is the power of the cross and our identity in Christ and the other two, which continues, um, you know, till till uh, we reach, we are with the Lord is having our renewed minds and walking with the spirit. So each of us, each of us can do this and we can we can begin to see how we change you know we are transformed in the inner man where our personal transformation takes place okay uh, in, in, uh, the last thing that i do want to bring about is um, one of the questions that came up last time i think it was christopher who who spoke about this and said what do we do um, you know if if um, uh, uh, you know as in 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 a marriage relationship uh, when there is one person who probably is, um, you know, has a negative attitude or or has a difficult temperament or a or a or a difficult behavior. What do you do when you observe this kind of negative attitudes in your spouse? How do you approach some of this? Okay, so I think first and foremost is, um, you know, this is wonderful if the two of you can agree that you're going to hold each other accountable. That you are going to live a life that that is transformed, um, and uh, and and work on these three things: your attitude, your temperament, <clears throat> and your behavior. So coming together in agreement and saying, you know, let's hold each other accountable. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful place to be in, because if we don't do that, we may appear to be either nagging or we may be uh, trying to be feel more self righteous or as if we are uh, policing the other one, and it may it may cause a lot more damage than it causes harm. Okay, so yes, when you do observe some kind of a negative uh, attitude in your spouse, it, it is you know it, it can be brought up lovingly. And now there are, if you look at uh, um, uh, the page. If you look at page 68 and 69, there are some examples that are given there, you know, how you can bring this up uh, in the most endearing way to your spouse. Uh, so I think uh, let's let's probably read the first one. It says when your spouse is complaining or grumbling about the way things are or certain situations at home or work or church or anywhere else, how is it that you can respond? What if we see the good that is happening and we choose to accept and enjoy the good instead of focusing on the not so good? Okay, so that's a way that you can respond. You could also respond like, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, life can be hard. Uh, certain situations can be hard. But, you know, we, we are called to look at every blessing. We are called to look at the good things that we are called. So maybe, you know, as an exercise, how about if you and I um, look at the number of blessings that we have and, uh, you know, uh, encourage ourselves. So this is a, these are ways that you can respond. Now, th this this kind of an environment would definitely need both you and your spouse to be absolutely calm, absolutely willing to be spoken into, to be, uh, you know, for in any kind of attitude that, that you may see to be held up and to be picked up. Like, that's why I said, you know, it is important to come up to a place of accountability that, you know, you are willing to do that for, for each other. But it's definitely something that uh, in prayer, uh, you know, I think for those of you who are married, discuss this with your with your spouses and, and ask if the two of you can come to a place because uh, one of the best mirrors that you have is your spouse who can actually tell you what you are. So what you are inside the home is 
um, you know, is who you really are, right? So getting that that form of a um, understanding can can be extremely helpful. Okay. Uh, so what what I um, you know what y'all can do is there are a lot of um, uh, checks over here on how. Uh, you know, what are some of your attitudes or your behaviors and your temperaments? And it's there, it's on the application page of page 66 and 67 and a little bit into 68. If you can take time to do this and, um, you know, uh, work on this and, and use these these personal transformation truths that we spoke about, um, do that uh, and, and begin to see how life can change for you, the way that you see yourself, the way that you see others, and the way that you see life uh, will, will have a marked change. Okay. I'd like to open this for questions if there are any. We have maybe around two or three minutes uh, before our break. Uh, so, would anyone like to bring up any question? Are we all in under personal transformation right now? Yes, Charles. Yes, please give me a question. It's not a question, Pastor. It's not a question? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. It's an insight, please. I'd love to hear you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, um, I wanted to go back to First Peter chapter three, verse seven through eleven, uh, where he's saying that we need to live with our wives with proper understanding that they are more delicate than us. Uh, this this understanding helps us to treat them uh, with with that respect. It helps us to to make us able to, to know how to, to handle them because <clears throat> wives have been given uh, the greatest task of submission and they will always find it hard to be submissive. But when you learn that they are also struggling with that, then you will be able to handle them. It has helped me to even handle, uh, yes, because I know it's a struggle, it's hard for them to submit. So I have to treat them so that I will even be helpful in ha helping them in how to submit and I become an example. I do my part and then they find themselves rhyming with what we have done or what we have said. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much. I think that's... Uh... That's, uh, that's great to hear, you know, how, how you have applied, you know, God's word in a very practical way um, in, in your marriage. And that, that's wonderful. So the, so the next um, portion of which is we're going to be getting into roles of marriage. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear examples of how you feel you fulfilled your role or your spouse has fulfilled their role and learn from each other. So, so I, know, I know most of us would have read this many times. So um, we'd, we'd probably take around maybe 10 minutes to really share of how we've lived out those roles uh, within marriage. Okay, thank you, thank you, Charles. All right, uh, we'll um, meet back uh, in a couple of minutes for our second class and uh, yeah, see you soon.